Before we get started, I wanted to say a special thank you to today's sponsor, Sam Ash Music. If you play music in Las Vegas, you know Sam Ash. You can pick up microphones, percussion, guitars, pianos, all sorts of musical instruments. They also have lessons and special uh, performances on their stage. It, it's overall a great place to go. You should definitely check them out. And um, tell them Josh sent you from Room 6. More importantly, click the link down in the description. It'll take you to their online website. It will help the channel out. I appreciate it. I know you'll appreciate it. Thank you, Sam Ash, for sponsoring today's video. And uh, thank you for watching. So let's go. Now, have you been actually working the last three months? Oh, yeah, I've been working. It's funny because I started a new job at a new firm, which so 2020 was the year of promise, you know? Year yeah. of new job, <laughs> you know, new gig. Nope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you're enjoying the content Room 6 is putting up, please make sure you subscribe down there and hit the bell so you don't miss an episode. While you're at it, feel free to like and share. And uh, yeah, let's go. Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local Las Vegas music scene and the people that make it, including me. I'm Josh, and today I'm very happy to do another video online interview. It's been a minute, and I'm happy to get back to it. We have a wonderful singer-songwriter. I've actually reviewed his CD. Uh, link is here. And he's been playing around town about five years, but he's been playing music a lot longer than that. He's here to promote his latest single, Pandemic, a timely topical tune, uh, on the heels of his uh, the CD I reviewed in Yo County. Please welcome to the show, Russell Christian. Hey, Russ. Hey, Josh. How you doing? I'm unbelievable. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah. Uh, happy Canada Day. Not that it matters to either one of us, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't know that was a thing, but I saw it online. And yep, it's July 1st. Uh, it, so at time of recording, it is, uh, you know, Canada Day. Um, I had a video drop today that if I'd been thinking, <laughs> I would have worn my Canada shirt. And I'm not Canadian, but I have lots, <laughs> but I have friends who are. And, sure, um, sure. I, I, uh, we've, we've even got a Canadian flag for some reason, but uh, whatever. Anyway, um, welcome to the show. Cheers. I'm going to have a drink. I'm going to have a drink. Yeah, me too. What are you drinking? Drinking, uh, so it's funny, I, the new Dylan came, album came out, so I figured I'd try the, this is not a paid promotion or anything, but the, the Bob Dylan brand Heaven's Door whiskey. It's pretty good. Uh, but meaning to try it out, what is it, um, is it a, uh, it's a bourbon? Yeah, so it, it's a bit, bit of a controversy, if you ask me. It says Tennessee bourbon, but oh. I, I was under the impression that it had to be from Kentucky to be a bourbon, so. Mm, yeah, I, I'm not 100% I'm not familiar with all the, the laws and everything. Yeah. But I think the fact that they said Tennessee bourbon makes it, like, okay, because otherwise, they can't just say it's bourbon, because then Kentucky's going to have a problem. Okay, I, yeah, that sounds about right. So it's, yeah. uh, it's good. It sounds like a, it, it tastes like a cross between a bourbon, a traditional bourbon, and, like, a Tennessee whiskey, like a Jack Daniels, but it's not as charcoal-y. Mm -hmm. But not quite as pure. It's sort of like a romantic comedy of whiskeys. It's right on. Not quite romantic, not quite funny, but just banal enough to be in the middle. <laughs> uh, as uh, faithful viewers know of the channel, I also do whiskey reviews uh, sometimes with my uh, my drummer and uh, whiskey sommelier uh, Sean Flume, <laughs> yeah. and uh, he knows a lot more than I do about this stuff. But uh, we'll have to uh, we'll have to try that one out. Yeah, um, it's pretty good. They yep. make a um, double barrel whiskey. I have tried. That's the best one. That's the ah, best one, Grant. So you're, you're slumming it today. My opinion. Yeah, I'm slumming it. Yeah. Well, I am going with a um, Angry Orchard Crisp Apple uh, Hard Cider. Uh, and, nice. Uh, it, it's better when it's cold, but, you know, summer. <laughs> mm. No worries, man. So now that we've got the drink review out of the way, um, <laughs> welcome, welcome. I uh, want to say, first, first off, obviously, you, you don't have any live shows coming up anytime soon, do you? No, and you know what? And I haven't really been doing the live streams, but I kind of want to. But and that's a whole separate topic. But uh, yeah, I mean, no, no live shows, which is a bummer because 2019 was my busiest year ever. I was playing shows, and then starting 2020, I was playing shows. And you know, I did, I did a show in LA last year, and a show in Nashville in March. That was my last show, so I was like gearing up to you know, really try to do a lot more and travel stuff and play some shows so yeah you and a lot of other people i know that uh quite a number of uh, local musicians that they they make a living from music and when it happened 
they're like, crap, we got rent. We got yeah. bills. Um, and so they're, you know, they're playing and they're doing, you know, tip us on Patreon or whatever. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, just like me, like you, you've got a, a day job, but I, I, you're an attorney, correct? Yes. I'm turning here in town. Yeah. What, what uh, can I ask what branch? Uh, I do civil litigation. I do uh, what we call insurance defense law. So long story short, if, uh, if you get in a car accident and you know, insurance company it hires an attorney to represent you, if you get sued, mm -hmm. that's what we do. Gotcha. You got a catchy jingle? <laughs> no, no, no better call Saul. Nothing like that. We <laughs> don't really have to Saul. advertise because it, you know, it, everyone, you know, if you got car insurance, um, mm -hmm. you get an attorney. And, and so, the advertisement or marketing, so to speak, is more attorney to insurance company and, you know, go to conferences and that kind of stuff and right. networking events and stuff like that. But you don't really advertise to the general public. So, now, Have you been actually working the last three months? Oh, yeah. I've been working. It's funny because I started a new job at a new firm. Which So 2020 was the year of promise, you know? Year of yeah. promise. New job. <laughs> Except, you know, new gig. nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, things are great. And the firm I'm at is a great firm. I love it. And they're, they're based in San Diego. So my first week was the week that everything shut down when it's just like order the stay-at-home order. But they had planned. They're like, oh, yeah, we're going to file the new attorneys out to, you know, La Jolla to our headquarters. You know, three days fun in the sun training. I'm like, this is awesome. Sounds like a recipe for... <laughs> yeah i got to work it's like day two they're like all right everybody go home i'm like uh, question i don't know how to use the computer <laughs> or how any of these programs work or i don't know anyone's names and anyway, so. wow so it's been a learning curve learning curve yeah but the the other attorneys that started on the same time and come up to the different offices uh well, kind of bonded over it. We we're like, does anyone else feel like you <laughs> right. kind of got sent home with no idea what, what to do? That's awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm essential. Uh, I work in the telecommunications uh, field uh, and that's a glorified way of saying I do tech support, uh, but I don't do tech support for like people that call me. I, okay. I, I work it. I, I literally sit in a warehouse and my customers are the pickers in the warehouse who are picking these VoIP phones and switches and routers and things, oh, wow. things that, you know, uh, uh, for voice over IP telephony, uh, those those businesses communication, you know, it's, sure. it's crucial mo now more than ever. So my job is to figure out either one, did it do its thing? Two, why didn't it do its thing? Three, how do I make it do its thing? Um, and and it's been uh, today actually it really picked up a lot uh, over the last you know few weeks. Uh, they they bumped uh, my my I have a, a partner and I, we, we are the only ones in uh, Nevada doing this job for the company. Wow. And there's only like seven of us in the entire company of, you know, it's a billion dollar company, thousands and thousands of, of employees. Sure. But we're the only like seven people doing this job, which is cool. But uh, he and I, are, we both got knocked down to 32 hours a week along with our compatriots in our, uh, at the home office for the last month and a half or so, which is, wow. you know, you're losing a day of pay. It's not a huge deal. Yeah, considering the situation. Yeah. But man, I got used to not going in until 9.30, I tell you. Yeah. And to, the, yesterday was, uh, the time of recording, yesterday was Monday, and it was like, man, I got to get up at 6.30 again. <laughs> sucks. Just yeah. working full time crap. Anyway, enough, but, but enough of my first world problems. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm just happy to so, have a job. You know? Yeah. All right, so let's get to the proper interview questions. And I'm going to apologize in advance. So I'll have two like usual interview questions that you're probably going to hate, but eh, sure, yeah. people want to know. So um, first of all, how long have you been in Vegas? I've been in Vegas um, permanently since 2010. Uh, I interned out here when I was in law school, summer 2008, I've done that count. So um, full-time since 2010. Right on. And then how long have you been doing music uh, in total? Oh, long time. See, I'm, 40 now and started playing guitar, writing songs. I was 17, 18. So I was senior in high school. So 22 years. Um, yeah, for a while. <laughs> right on. What, yeah. um, when, when you first got to town, where, where'd you come from? If I may ask. So yeah, long story. So I grew up in Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, went to undergrad in DC. I'm kind of, this part of my life. Life's my origin story, if, if you will. I'm not saying I'm a Marvel hero or anything like that, but uh, but yeah. So I kind of lived all over un undergrad in D.C. and then uh, lived in Maine for two years. Um, 
worked in Kentucky one summer, uh, <laughs> then found my way in Michigan, um, lived there for about uh, seven years, met my wife there, uh, and then we moved to Vegas from Michigan. So, so definitely a culture shock. Yeah, yeah. And a temperature shock, yeah. Temperature shock, yeah, for sure. So I grew growing up in Georgia, down south, you know, it's hot, but it's humid. And, yeah. and even in the evenings, it cools off. So getting out here was uh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, in the summer, you do not go sit out on the porch with some, you know, mint julep or some lemonade. You, you, <laughs> you're like, yeah. and, and now you've been here long enough, so you know there's summers where you just walk out the door and you're like, nope, <laughs> whatever I was yeah. going to do is <laughs> not happening. Sure. There's some summers, like, I felt like last summer and so far this summer, it's been mild. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's like, wait, okay, when's it going to get bad? Because, I, I, you know, we haven't hit 120 yet. Yeah. Those are the days where you're just like, <sighs> whatever I was going to do, that's a wall of heat. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't even and, take the trash and, out. I mean. Yeah. And I work yeah. in a warehouse. So I, like, I, I have to deal with the cold and the, and the heat. And there's lots of fans. And I got, like, the, the, the towels that, you know, you get wet and stuff. Sure, sure. But it don't matter. You know, I get in, the, I get in my, my car at the end of the work day. It's hot. Yeah, I crack the windows hot. and still it's hot. It's going to be hot. And it's yeah. my commute's only like eight minutes. So there's no cooling off by the time I get home, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It takes 10 minutes for the air conditioner to like even get remotely cool. Yeah. Um, which is uh, a whole other problem for, you know, like musical instruments and things like that. And, and we'll get to taking care of musical instruments in, in, uh, later, but um, let's talk musical influences. Uh, what was your earliest musical influence? Um, well, that's, you know, that's an interesting question because we all, um, that's why you know, I ask it. I'm sorry. That's why I ask it. That's why I ask it. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, you know, in, because there's influences you have before you get into playing and writing. And then there's influences you have that sort of develop your love of music. If it makes sense. Oh yeah. And, and what I'm going for is what was that first thing that was like, I want to do that, or I want to sound like oh, yeah. that, or I want to learn this song or this genre. Well, I, that's so, so I was in high school, senior year of high school, and I was in a history class, and we were watching these videos, like History of Rock and Roll or whatever. And uh, I, I remember the exact moment. There's an interview with Joey Ramone, and he's <laughs> talking about punk rock, and he's saying, you know, we love Led Zeppelin and these bands, and I'm paraphrasing. You can probably find it on YouTube. He's like, you know, we can't play like that, but we still wanted to make music, you know. But So, so it's like a learning curve, you know. How can I make music if I can't play like Jimmy Page? So he said, we just – wrote songs with three chords and just wrote about shit that we knew like going to party or whatever and yep. and and i remember watching it and i'm like fuck i can do that you know three chords and talk about shit that's going on in your life well 20 something years later it's really hard to do uh, but <laughs> yeah. that was the impetus i was like i, I can do that because i'd already gotten into writing poetry and stuff like that so I, and my brother was playing guitar so my friends were playing guitar so i was like all right i'm gonna start writing, you know, these poems, but with a melody. And at first, like, friends would just strum chords. Like, yeah, that works. That, that sounds good, you know? Yeah. But that was, that was for me, the impetus. Uh, and that set it off, you know, path that brought me here today, so. Nice. Um, I, I definitely, for me, I can remember being maybe, like, five. Oh, wow. I mean, it definitely, like, pre seven years old i because I, I, I i moved down from uh uh i used to live up in the mountains in crestline then we wow. moved and then we moved and, and i remember i was seven at that time uh when we moved so it was before that and i remember like my brother drew being he was he's always like the cool the cool guy you know <laughs> yeah, yeah and he introduced me to kiss yeah there you go i don't remember what album i just remember bound, jumping up and down on the couch and and it was one of those like I want to, you know, I want to make noise, basically. Yeah. You know, I was like, eh. But um, as far as actually being a singer songwriter, that didn't happen till I like I graduated college. Oh, sure. I'm sorry, high school. And I was away at college, and I was things were not necessarily good. I was lonely and sure uh, pining after a girl and all that junk. And yeah, and, we'll and I I. And, and MTV was actually playing music videos and <laughs> wow. there was a time kids yeah. anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, like Pearl, J it was, you know, the grunge, you had Pearl jam, you had Nirvana, you had, you know, and, and Metallica was making noise and making waves, all that stuff. I was starting to was like, I want to 
I had a guitar and I, and I was like, I, I want to, I want to make this kind of stuff. I want to mm-hmm. make music where I, it, it makes sense to me now at this point in life. And as opposed to whatever they were working on in the seventies, you know? Yeah. And so, um, I, I hate to say it, MTV and VH1 influenced me as a singer songwriter. <laughs> well, yeah, they used to play, that used to be where you'd see music and see yep. the cutting, you know, cutting edge stuff. I had a VCR. And I used to, I had, I would record, um, I, I, I would just sit there and wait. And I would record like every video that appealed to me. Yeah. And so, and I learned like, okay, if I want to sound like him, I need to do this. And if I want to, you know, and, and, and what's he, what's he playing on that, you know, that, that, uh, chord, that guitar. Yeah. Cause I didn't know how to read guitar music sure. or sheet music. And, um, I, I didn't even know how to read tab at that point. I was yeah. total, you know, totally green. But well, pre-internet, I mean, you know, it's hard to explain. It's hard to oh, yeah, understand, yeah. you know? Um, there was a time, kids. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Before the internet. Yes. Moving on. Um, what is... Like I said, it's been a minute since I did one of these. I'm, 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 I'm having an I'm embarrassing blank out here. Yeah, okay. no worries, man. Let's talk um, shows. Sure. What would you say is your favorite show memory up to this point of oh. you performing? Uh, there's so many. Um, cause really, you know, my musical, um, I was a career cause I kind of have a career, but what I've done is sort of like two phases. There was the early days, you know, high school and right. college. I played in several bands. Um, cause initially sort of dovetail with the last question. Initially I was like, I want to play in a band. I want to write songs, but play with my friends. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, drink beer and, and, and play shows and have a good time. And then the second part of the career is just acoustic singer songwriter, which developed through getting older, not having friends around to be in a band. And I'm like, I have <laughs> songs and, and then listening to more Dylan and Neil Young and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's the, the playing shows, you know, solo and playing shows younger. So they're apples and oranges. Um, but is so, there one where you, like it just really stands out in your mind as that was a good time or hey I almost got arrested or yeah you know. so I remember playing shows uh, I'll I'll go back to the early days uh, playing shows I, I lived in a house in college and um, it was in DC and we had like a lock on the front door and a lock on the basement door with like a bars and we we would like set up the band in the in this unfinished basement and have like house parties and just play and it was so loud and the cops would always come but we'd like open the door and like the the bars were locked and the cops would say open the lock and no and we'd leave the bars locked and like can we help you and they're like yeah you need to turn the fuck down and we're like okay bye and we play more so that was kind of fun but you know you, that's a non-sustainable uh business model of, of playing that's yeah. kind of stuff you can get away with in your 1920 for a few shows so, I mean, you know, I wouldn't want to do that nowadays. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, but, but, but sounds fun. those were, what's that? Sounds fun, though. Yeah, those were the fond memories of like, oh, I remember the stupid shit we used to do when we were 19. I mean, it was fun because that, to me, like, that's kind of like the heart of why you get into it because it's like, you know, we weren't really making money. Which, and, and a lot of what we were doing, we were playing songs, original songs, and then some covers, you know, party covers, whatever, a kind of punk alternative sort of stuff. It was fun. It was just like, that's young people enjoying music for what it is without any sort of you know, commercialization or anything like that. But um, um, anyway, to get on to the second part of the career, uh, mm-hmm. playing solo, I, 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 there's a lot of single shows that, that stand out, but I, I've really enjoyed getting to know other singer songwriters here in town. And it's rare that if ever that I think I ever do a show just me. Right. It's always on a bill with a couple you know, other people uh, two of my biggest, most frequent partners in crime are Michael Lewis Austin and Joey Hines, both, you know, good friends of mine. So to me, it's like, I think the, the enjoyable part for me has been all the shows sort of blend together, but, but the experience of making friends, listening to their music, they listen to your music that to me in this second part of career, I've, I've really enjoyed. Um, right on. and we've had a couple of good shows, the artifice, a couple of places. So. Hang on one second, I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm back. And uh, speaking of Joey Hines. Yeah, <laughs> gotta love those. Yeah, I, 
the genius of marketing that is Joey Hines. Yeah. Let's just, you know, insult myself, which is great. Go for it. Um, I just thought, uh, I, I, I knew that. I was tempted to wear it, actually, on, on camera. And I was like, nah, I don't need it. It's not about Joey. Yeah. Since you brought him up. Yeah. It's always it's about, not about you. Fuck Joey. Yeah, yeah fuck Joey Hines. <laughs> anyway. No. See, there's a good band. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well played reference. Yeah. Yeah, well. Um, they really do suck. Anyway, um, getting, getting back to my job here. Uh, so we talked about early, your, your earliest musical uh, influences. We talked about, uh, favorite show memory. What's some current musical influences that are kind of when, when you want to like get jazzed up, wh- what do you listen to? So, you know, it's interesting. Um, I kind of got into the singer songwriter thing hard and I listened to a lot of them and I listen, but I, I listen to, you know, Oh, everything. Every, but um, in terms of, since I, I do singer songwriter type music, I'll sort of stick with people in that genre. I'll tell you. Um, no, no, um, whatever, whatever you listen to, man, whatever you, you like, go for it. I like a lot of the modern guys. Josh Ritter is a favorite of mine. I think he's one of the best lyricists that's out there. Great songwriters. It's a guy, a Christian, I forget his last name, but he plays under the name uh, Tallest Man on Earth. And I didn't, somebody told me about him a couple of years ago. He's really good. A uh, really good singer songwriter. Um, but um, it's weird. My my taste in music, even when I was a young kid in college, they used to call. There used to be a band, the the John Spencer Blues Explosion. Remember that band? I have heard the name. Yes. Yeah. My friends used to call me the Russell Christian Blues Explosion because <laughs> all I listened to was like Delta Blues. Like I got, I kind of got hooked on the blues about eighteen, and I listened to it hard, like almost all the time. So, so I kind of, I roots music has always been huge for me. Uh, folk, country bluegrass, uh, all the early stuff. I, I forced myself to listen to modern music and I sound like an old crotchety man, but I, but I mentioned this cause I've always kind of been like this. I just like the older stuff. Um, so I like modern artists that interpret the older stuff, but sometimes I like modern artists that are cr- just out there and new. I think part of it is a talent. There's a, with, a, with buttons and stuff, it's, it's an easier learning curve and you can instantly sound listenable. Even right. if maybe you don't have, the chops or whatever, but, uh, um, Galdern kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm on a, I've been on a kick uh, with Josh Ritter for several years. Um, that guy's just, he's one of the best. Um, Christian, as I just mentioned, is, is a great song. There. Jason Isbell is one of the, the modern, like he's, he's the most popular, most famous, well-known singer songwriter. And he's like blown out of the, blown the genre out of the water. But, um, uh, but I listen to a lot of, just, a, I can't even, get into all the American roots music um, and listen to a lot. You know, I haven't, I've been on a jazz kick lately for years. I always tried to get into jazz and I never could. And Miles Davis recently has blown it out of just blown my mind. So I'm like, okay, I think I kind of get it. Um, it's a 36 minute song. It's, you know, weird, you know, but I'm like, I, I think I'm starting to get it. I like it's it. the notes you don't play. Yeah. 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 Um, it, 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 that it, Miles Davis to me always kind of, it, it, kind of fell into the same camp as Jimi Hendrix in that there was so much stuff Jimi Hendrix did before they were, he was Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, he played, I can't remember the singer's name right now, but he was in a band where he, he was just the guitar player. Yeah. And he played with little Richard. He did. Yes. Yeah. And, and same with Miles Davis is like, what was Miles Davis doing before Miles Davis was Miles Davis. He, he was, you know, session player and doing, you know, playing with other bands and eventually was like, I got my own sound. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. And I'm liking the stuff, the 60s, 70s, the wild experimental, uh, you know, Bitches Brew era, that kind of stuff. It's like, drugs. Yeah, this stuff's, <laughs> that's, what's that? Drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, this stuff is crazy, man. And I was listening to one the other day, and I, the name of the track escapes me. I was listening to it, and it's like, that's the freaking Mario Brothers. It's doo 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 do, 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 do. And I was like, "That's Mario. That World One Two, the Underworld. That's the yeah, yeah. they stole that. They stole that." So Underworld. I was like, da, 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 da. "Yeah, do, do, yep. do. anyway." So no copyright. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So moving back over to venues real or uh, uh, shows real quick. What would you say is your dream show? Like either a show you want to play with a particular act, or you want to be part of a tour, or you want to just play a, a particular venue. 
you know, I'd love to just play a really good venue that's known to where people want to hear original acoustic, you know, songwriter type music with an attentive crowd. Um, doesn't have to be big, a small, intimate theater. Um, that would be something that would be great. Right. That, you know, something like, a. When I grew up in Atlanta, there was something called the Fox Theater, um, which is probably a little big for my taste, but it was sort of the old-fashioned theater with the first row and then sort of the balcony. And right. I've seen some theaters that are like tiny microcosm versions of that. There's one in Chicago, and the name escapes me right now, but uh, um, I actually don't. don't Joe Pug I did a live album there. It's another great singer. I know of the one you speak. I don't think it's in business anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Who, who knows now? Yeah. You know? Something like, you know, I, I'd love to play – a show like that, just, uh, you know, sure. 500,000 people doesn't have to be huge, but, <laughs> but intimate, you know, nice wooden, full fashioned wooden stage, just me and the guitar. I'd love that. Right on. Um, is there any, um, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this, but, uh, with, with quarantine and with, with just everything that's going on, I mean, 2020 has been a hell of a year. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Did you get a, a gift from Zoom? Yeah, I, I did a, too. I just got a message. Yeah. You see that? that yeah. was weird. Right in the middle of our meeting. Thanks, yeah. Zoom. What the hell? Right but, when you said 2020 has been weird, then we get a message. like It says a gift from going Zoom. going on with your Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Stop <laughs> yeah. listening. Wait, I'm recording. <laughs> I want you to listen. Yeah. I'm recording. So um, what I was going to say was, obviously, you know, the pandemic has affected you because you wrote a song about it. Yeah. You know, and um, how do you see going forward when venues open up for live music, like the Sand Dollar has opened up here in town. Yeah. Um, and they tried social distancing, but people were not following it at all. Sure. Um, but, but how do you foresee it causing, um, or how do, you, how do you think it's going to affect performing when you're on stage what either with or without you can't wear a mask if you're singing people you won't be able to hear you clearly um how does that affect you seeing a crowd of people who also are not wearing masks you know you know right now it would be it'd be difficult um you know i'm yeah. not i'm not here i'm not a cdc expert i'm not a communicable disease expert you know we're all just kind of trying to follow the rules and um well some of us are yeah, it's like, you know, we're, I'm wearing masks where I go and I'm, and I'm worried. And, and um, you know, I think I think once we get a vaccine, knock on wood, hopefully that will, you know, I mean, we'd all love to just sort of get back to, you know, just not have to worry about us like that. So knock on wood, if that vaccine comes and everything, you know, um, great. But even if it comes and, and this is something moving forward, we just have to get used to. I think that, you know, we'll adapt and and. And you've already seen just in the past few months people doing things, still trying to be productive musically. Right. Um, hopefully it doesn't mean that old school style venues will all shut down and we're going to new types of venues. But I mean, if it gets to that, I mean, um, well, it's in. Go ahead. I was going to say a lot of them were resorting to, hey, we still have food. You can still, you know, we can deliver. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I, you could see a venue like, so, say something like backstage bar and billiards downtown, you know, it's a big right. open floor. You could always set up like tables, you know, six, eight feet apart. And so, you know, you got to wear a mask and sit and you can have a smaller crowd. And, you know, for a band or an artist that's more well known that is relying on a certain amount of gate, you know, maybe the tickets cost more. I mean, that kind of sucks because, you know, concerts are already expensive. Pandemic but, tax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure there's ways, but, I don't know. You can feel free to disagree. I mean, I've been watching a lot of live show, uh, live streams from both local artists, people I know and friends, as well as, you know, it, it's the great equalizer because even, you know, the Elton Johns of the world or whoever, they're all stuck at home too. And it's kind of funny because you watch, um, who was, they did the, the battle. It was the two guys that had some sort of like rap battle and it was panned because the, the uh, was it Babyface, I think? I, I, I can't remember. Um, there was two guys that did some sort of Zoom like this. They're supposed to do some sort of music bottle. But it was pain because, like, neither of them knew how to do the work the technology. So it's like this oh, is the that's great, funny. Yeah, it's the, it's the great equalizer because I'm laughing seeing 
you know, Bon Jovi or, or who are these people playing acoustic guitar at home with a shitty phone mic. And it's like, you know, for years, my friends and family would be like, oh, why doesn't your recording sound like his? I'm like, because guess what? Fucking it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do you, have you seen my setup? Like that guy records at the, the, you know, the power station or whatever. And now you're hearing Bon Jovi and acoustic guitar at home. And it's like, Hey, his voice cracked. I'm like, that's how it fucking sounds, you know? So yeah, um, his voice would crack at a, at a show too. Guess what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People, people who actually sing live, like, you know, their voice at the end of the night, their voice is a little up, uh, you know? So I'm like, yep. you know, not every recording is perfect. So it's kind of funny. Cause I'm noticing like some, some stars sound just as good or even better. I saw one with uh, Sturgill Simpson, another uh, get back to your conversation. Great, great current artist. He sounds like even better on the phone than he does on the album. But then some artists, I'm not going to name names, you, you listen to them and you're like, how's this person like famous? I don't, I don't get it. So, and then I hear people that I'm friends with. I'm like, this person sounds freaking amazing. Why aren't they famous? You know? Yeah. How come I don't see you doing shows and stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I was actually impressed. Um, uh, a band that's actually one of the very few first bands that came on and did an interview on Room 6, uh, Crimson Riot, who yeah. their, their day job is Roxy Gun Project. Uh, Roxy and Chris and and Ryan, um, they are have been live streaming since this thing started, yeah. Like almost before it started, and they literally are relying on this to you know pay rent and, and buy groceries and things. And I and I was listening. I'm like, this is really good audio. How did they do this? Yeah. But then again, they got a board and they got like they know what they're doing. They've been doing it so long and and, and um, running their own sound and everything that to them it's just like all right we just we'll do some testing and figure it out yeah what's well, like i saying like so i got this usb mic which when i first started re recording at home this is what i was using it's not really great for that but it's better than what's on your phone or on the computer so you know that sounds good and i've got my usb mixer which isn't you know it's not as good as your focus right or whatever but i'm like you plug a, an SM58 through that and run it through the computer. Sounds pretty yeah. darn good, you know? Yeah, one thing like, doing... we... So go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. It's like we as, like, independent artists have had... We know how to use our all our stuff, and maybe some artists haven't necessarily had to figure out how to work the bedroom, uh, you know, recording equipment, you know? They're the talent. Yeah, they have other people yeah. Do that. yeah. Um, well, I, like, I, we wear many, many hats at our level. We're, we're the yeah. writer... The singer, the songwriter, the producer, the recorder, the mixer, the master. I'm like exactly, everything. like this doing doing this has taught me a lot that I didn't know beforehand about you know shooting videos and about uh, staging and all that stuff. And you can even see the progression uh, going from like my first videos to now. Yeah, and things have changed. Um, I, I hope improved. <laughs> but, it looks great. But uh, I was just whining to my wife before this interview. I'm like. I love doing interviews, but everything's setting up. Why can't I have people? Why can't I just do it now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And she just laughed at me. And I, I mean, I was totally joking, but at the same time, I'm like, it'd be nice just to show up and just yeah. do the thing. But it wouldn't, I wouldn't be the performer I am. And, and you know, doing these videos is, is performing. Sure. Um, and I, I have, you know, I have fond and not so fond memories of, you know, loading the gear and unloading the gear and playing yeah. the set and forgetting you have to take it home and then loading the gear <laughs> yeah. and unloading the gear. Cause you know, wife needs the van in the morning, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, and that's another reason I started doing this is, is I don't, I just can't anymore go out all the time. Like I, like I used to. Yeah. My liver can not handle it for one thing, but <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, my wallet either, but you know, it's not, um, it's not such an issue now, but, uh, but I, I went to sand dollar actually. Um, and I, I, I was there, a uh, uh, cover band was playing Jimmy powers V and the hang dynasty. They've got original stuff too. And I'm hoping to get cool. them on the show, but they, they were, the tables were socially distanced. Okay. But the bar stools weren't like, they weren't like, okay, no, this game is a, you can't use this one and you can't use this one. And it, it I think including the people that work there, I was, one of like five people wearing a mask and the place was sure, yeah and, and i it, it was just ridiculous like trying to distance yourself from people unless you were sitting at one of, unless you had managed to snag one of those tables in front of the stage um then you know by default you're you're um socially distanced but right it's getting back to my question i, I think i agree with you that 
the game's going to change. Even going, even when there's a vaccine or, or, or whatever, they say, okay, you're good to go. You don't have to wear a mask everywhere. You can touch people. You know, yeah. we can hug. Um, I personally will never do any sort of live performing w- w- with anybody else's microphone <laughs> anymore. Yeah, even before all this, that's always kind of. Well, I, I, I would, sh- depending on the place, if sure. I knew, I'd show up and I'd be like, okay, fine. I know you're good. You know, you, you're used to mixing for a 58. Go for it. Yeah. Fine. You know, this thing is for the yeah. jazz band. Yeah. There you that, go. That's all. I'm, I'm not going to try and like rock, rock out with that thing. Cause that's just not me. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, I'll definitely be bringing my, my own microphones and my own cables and just like, I got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me yeah, you gotta be self-sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, anywho, moving on. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is your, your earliest memory of performing in front of people? Um, musically or just any sort of performance? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I remember when I was five years old in kindergarten reading for the Christmas play in kindergarten. I mean, I don't know All right, we'll do music. We'll do music. Yeah, yeah, I'm having music. Uh, the first one I remember when senior year of high school, um, we had sort of like a field day deal every year, and they'd always have bands. Um, and this was right around the time when I'd seen that Joey Ramone, you know, interview and was starting to write just stupid, silly songs or whatever. So I gathered a couple of my friends together. I'm like, let's start a band. Like, he had to – turn in your name to, you know, play in a band. So, so we put together a band and we were terrible, but it was, it was really fun. And, and like, you know, the schools is a big audience. There's probably hundreds of people that are watching. Right. And it was fun. And I was like, this is freaking awesome. Like, who cares? We suck, but I'll get better. You know? Um, so that was the first experience I had playing in a band, playing music. Um, I, and I didn't even play guitar at the time. I didn't know how to play. I was just singing. And we do covers. We actually, and we did a couple of original songs and, so it's, you know, once you do that and you're hooked, you're like, this is really fun. <laughs> you know, I really enjoy it. Just yeah, having once, fun with once, your friends. Once you get stage. applause for any sort of thing you do. Sure. That's like, I, I want more, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I got to college, played in bands, and we kind of played at parties. And then, after, you know, once I started doing that, there was a coffee shop at college that had like acoustic night. And I'd already, you know, started getting yeah. into Dylan and everything and was doing the harmonica. So I would go out there and do some originals or covers, but Dylan style with the harmonica and everything. And I was like, this is a different kind of rush. It's exciting because you're just a one man machine, you know, one man band. Right. Um, and even if they, they, they may not applaud. They may just. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you know, I noticed they applaud more for like some of the upbeat stuff, but the slow stuff. And that's the thing where it's, it's difficult. A lot of my music is real slow. It's kind of sad. Um, that's sort of the music I like to listen to. And so it's, it's tough, especially when you're playing at a bar with unknown, you know, people don't know you, don't know your music and you're, you know, pouring your right. heart out and whatever. Anybody can get a good response when, you know, they, they, there, there's people that know them. It's yeah. Yeah. That's why yeah. I, I always wanted to go on tour. I, I never managed to go on tour. Um, yeah. and, and I always wanted to go on tour for that experience of every single night was a brand new audience until, you know, you got to the point where, okay, we're going on tour again. And maybe we've got, we've made those connections and they're going to love to do that. I'd love to, you know, it's funny. Like, um, I love to travel. I love to play. And I'm like, yeah, you know, obviously if you, if you could make a living traveling around, well, pre COVID, you know, traveling around playing shows and visiting cities. I mean, that that seems like a a dream. That'd be incredible. You know, just fun, you know, but um, that's, uh, it's got its own nightmares though. Yeah, is it, sure. Is it yeah, nothing's perfect, but yeah, um, I sit there as I stare at the computer all day, and I'm like, man, sure you wish I was on the road playing my playing my guitar. You'll say that, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's funny. Uh, that remind you know that reminds me of a story playing songs, you know, slow songs, and you were asking earlier about experiences. I'll tell you a funny story. Sorry, to get off topic. You know the Hard Hat Lounge here in town? Oh yeah, I played it. Yeah. Played the bus. Yeah. You played there? Yeah. So I, I played a few shows. Some of my first shows I played here in town were the Hard Hat. Mm-hmm. And I remember one show. It's, it's me, the bartender, my wife, number one fan, 
And then some guy at the end of the bar who's obviously not there for me, you know, chain smoking, playing the, the, on the poker, you know, game. He's just doing his thing. He's not bothering me, not heckling me or anything like that. So I'm like three, four, five songs into this. And, and you know, bartenders, you know, doing this. And my wife's doing this, you know. And that guy just could care less. He doesn't right. give zero shits that I'm playing. You know. So like the fifth song, and I, it's a song called Gray Sky off my first EP. I play the song. He puts a cigarette down. He looks at me. He goes, that's a good song. And I was like, <laughs> yes. Yes. You're like, you want to hear it six more times? <laughs> yeah, I'll keep playing it. So I'm like, you know, those are the fun experiences. Because when we play, like, we're always curious. Like, what songs do people like? Like, we have our favorites, but I'm like, this song may objectively suck, but I, I like it. I wrote it. I like it. Like, do, you, right. do people like this? Is this a good song? I don't know. No. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I've had that experience where, you know, you're done. You got no response. Yeah. And then somebody comes up to you. It says, hey, man, I really enjoyed it. And you're like, where the fuck were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Why didn't you clap, clap. something, something say, yeah. woo, you know, nothing. And yeah. that's why I always try to go overboard if I'm, especially at like uh, it, where it's a intimate concert, shall we say? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I've actually, I've, I've got a, a, a video I made of, about an, the same experience playing to, to a, a, two drunks and a bartender. Yeah, yeah, well. And and it did it, we did not have that response. <laughs> yeah. One of them got up, stumbled to the door, and on his way out, unplugged the distortion pedal, the guitar player. <laughs> so suddenly, boom, Ooh. no guitar, no guitar. And, yeah, and, and 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 I'm just like, keep going, I guess. Well, he fumbled, but I was like, as as protests go, or as you know, sure, expressing your just. We didn't hear Jack from them until that moment. Yeah. I'm like, if you don't like it, boo me. Yeah. Make a request, you know? Yeah. You but make it was, a Rolling Stones song or something, I'm sure. Pull yeah. some out of her ass. And like, at this what point, do you want to hear, dude? At this point in time, I think I was maybe 22. They were yeah. all under 21. And they were, we could play, and then they had to leave. So yeah, there you go. it's kind of traumatizing <laughs> to yeah. be exposed to a, a, a real drunk at that point. But um, yeah, that was San sure. Diego. Getting, speaking of San Diego. <laughs> Ah, I miss San Diego sometimes. Ah, oh, San Diego. Yes. Um, so, moving on. Let's talk gear. Sure. Okay. This is where the drummers salivate usually. Yeah. But um, what are you rocking right now when you do perform or record? So my main guitar, here I'll grab it real quick. One on the um, wall? I'm not, I'm not going to play, but the main guitar is this one right here. So I got this when I was uh, in high school. It's a Sigma guitar. It's sort of a backstory. But uh, I was helping a friend's sister move, and at the end of the day, I, this guitar had been in storage or something. Right. And I said, hey, do you, you know, buy it from me or whatever? At the end of the day, she gave my friends 40 bucks, and she said, you can either have 40 bucks or the guitar. So I'm like, it's a fucking guitar. So it's my first guitar, the one I learned to play on, my baby. Um, yep. And it's still my main guitar. Um, it's a Sigma, which in the 70s, I think when this was made, it, it was Martin's sort of lower end brand. Yeah, it, it's, your, it's your introductory, I want to learn how to play guitar or yeah. play acoustic. Yeah, Yeah, but they were made so well because I've read that Martin really, they were worried to have a lower end. So they like made super exacting standards and all this sort of stuff. And they're, oh, yeah, they're good collector's guitars. items. Yeah, they're, um, they're totally... They're totally viable guitar. Um, that guitar there, that's yeah. my first. That's the one. I don't write on that one anymore because I've got an Ibanez cutaway that that yeah. stays in tune. But <laughs> but this one is. There was there was a store. I don't think it exists anymore in San Diego. Yeah. Freedom guitars. Nice. Yeah, that's a Freedom guitar guitar. You look inside and there's a sticker that says Freedom guitars. There's no brand name on it. Like it's Freedom <laughs> guitar. Yeah. It's just. It was 88 bucks back in the, the 90s, and it was what I had in my account. And I was like, yes, please, I want one of those. And um, over the years, I've had other guitars that I've bought and maybe I sold or um, still have. But yeah. this is that one there. Every now and then, I will pull it down and take the crimson or take the so stoked cards out of it. Uh, yeah. And, and um, just to remember, but 
yeah i wrote a lot i wrote my first uh album on that actually um yeah. and i wrote the second one on the ivan s cutaway it's 199 guitar center special you know yeah none of these guitars are over 200 bucks <laughs> yeah yeah i um it's funny because i have so i'll put this way so this was this was my main and then when, when i played in bands my dad got me this this back when you could get strats for like 175 bucks you know mm-hmm. as a mexican strat 98 uh my dad got it for me in his birthday present like under 200 bucks you know for a mexican Nowadays, strat for under 200 bucks wow this is booking 1998, so you know, 20, 20 something years ago. So, yeah. um, and it just, it holds a tune. It still sounds great. Uh, so when I'm playing electric, even sometimes I play shows, this is, this and that one are my main, main guitars. Right on. Uh, I have the, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say, uh, and my wife bought me for my 40th birthday, uh, personally, really, really nice guitar. This 12 string, which I started, oh, this I've started playing live a lot more. Uh, just got that twelve string sound, which is funny. We were talking about Joey Hines earlier. He he was uh, he was looking at it, and I and I let him play it a little bit. And he ended up getting the same one. Um, yeah, yes, he did. Uh, yeah. What brand is that one? It's a Guild, which is it's fantastic, right. and it was under five hundred bucks. Uh, I think it caught it on sale. It might have been four hundred something like that, which that's a decent amount of money. But for for a pretty solid guitar nowadays, I mean, they start at like a thousand. I mean, they're just. He's a little, I'm like, yeah. you, guitars have gotten so fucking expensive. I mean, like I said, you used to be able to get 200 bucks, you know, a piece yeah. of wood with a freaking pickup on it. Sounds great. But um, anyway, so this I've started playing and recording on a lot more. And on the Inyo County EP that uh, you reviewed, thank you very much for that. No you, uh, you can hear this guy a lot on Glass Bottom Blues and uh, a couple of the other songs. Anyway. Yeah, twelve string always gives it that extra depth that you just you recognize. You're like, yeah. okay, that's either two guys playing, <laughs> one of them's tuned yeah. way different, <laughs> yeah. or twelve string. Um, all right, it's cool. So aside from that, when you play, you rocking any pedals? Uh, when I'm doing acoustic shows, I don't play pedals. Not even um, a tuner. I have. It's one got of a built-in little, tuner. Right. These guy, you know, deal at the end. Right. I sh- I have tried tuning pedals. I don't like them. I, once, once they started making these, what are they, the snark or noodle? Yeah, fingers? snarks. Yeah, they're just great, so I use those. Um, when I used to play in bands, I, I had a, a distortion, a compression, and a wah. Um, of course. I'm not – that? That's the holy trinity. You got to. Yeah, I, it's funny. You know, Joey, he's – so uh, – <laughs> Joey asked me, he, he has recorded an album recently, he hasn't put it out yet, but he'd asked me to play guitar on some of the tracks. Oh, nice. I, I make, I, I joke around because I, I kind of gave him this, hey, just so you know, you know, the tone is in your fingertips and you know, I don't use a <laughs> pedal, uh, blah, 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 blah. So we get there and like the first song, he's like, oh, here, you play this, what do you think? I'm like, hold up. And I pull out my like bag and I brought all my pedals just in case. I'm like, it needs a flanger with the chorus. You know? <laughs> he's like, well, okay, Russ. Thought you didn't use pedals, Russell. So, um, just because I don't yeah. use them doesn't mean yeah, I don't have yeah. them and know how to use them. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got some, and, and in the studio, certain songs we hear. But when I play live, I don't. I never use pedals anymore. Yeah. Um, that I never went. I, I tried real briefly one of those, like, uh, multi effects processors where you you can toe tap through your way through all yeah. the different sounds, and I didn't like it because. Number one, I, I had to remember, like, okay, what number was this song? What number was this yeah. song? But also, the songs I was writing did the Foo Fighters thing where it goes from distortion to, you know, clean or maybe some reverb. And you can't do that with one, you know, thing. It, um, and so I got, I really fell in love with the concept of a pedal board. Yeah. And here comes the distortion. And now it's off. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's and easier. I, yeah, um, if you're doing, say, a cover gig, playing acoustic, you know, then yeah, the 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 um, effects pedal, multi effects pedals, that's fine. You're like, yeah. I'm playing here for four hours, I'm playing all your hits, and I'm gonna, you know, I just need this tone. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, and this song is gonna be this tone all for the whole song kind of thing. Um, all right, moving on from your current gear. Any dream gear any wayne's world soon you'll be mine moment 
Yeah. So I'd want to. What are you lusting you know, after? Uh, a really good acoustic, maybe a vintage uh, Gibson Dove or uh, Hummingbird. Well, I just love the, you know, Gip. What's that? Of course. Yeah. The, um, it's funny because I pick up Martin. I go in Guitar Center sometimes and, you know, you pick up Martins and stuff. And, and, um, on the high end Martins and the high end Gibsons, it's, it's apples and oranges, but the Gibsons have that sort of more bright tone, mm -hmm. um, which is great. Part of me thinks I don't ever want to waste the money on Gibson because I've basically got a Gibson. It's, it's, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a Mar Martin. I don't want to waste the money on a Martin because the Sigma is made by Martin. I'm like, that sounds good enough. But the, the Gibsons have that mellow, you know, just, uh, you know, broom, you strum it. Right. Especially those, uh, those doves and Gibsons uh, of hummingbirds from the '60s, just uh, with the mellowed out wood, that would be, that would be the dream guitar. Right on. Hint, hint, yeah. wife. <laughs> What's that? Hint, hint, wife. Hint, hint, wife. Yeah, I got my Norman's rare guitar T-shirt. I'm like, you know, you can go there. And if you've got 15 grand laying around, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that you don't know about. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, from the highs of dream gear to the lows of losing gear, you ever lose one? Lose something? Oh. No, I've actually been pretty good about that. I've had to sell a lot of gear when I was broke, but I've never yeah. lost uh, or had anything stolen. Uh, and I find that good. with solo artists, that ha that's generally the case because this is it. This is my stuff, you know. Yeah. And and, and I, you fo you're very focused, and even after you're done playing, and people are like, you you want to schmooze, you get your stuff put away first. Yeah, I always do that. Yeah, yeah. The bands, when you're in a band, a lot of times, then suddenly, you know. Yeah. things happen but <laughs> it's a miracle I, yeah some of those nights but i like to hear sometimes uh, people have some interesting stories about how they lost gear or they forgot gear you know no yeah these like my guitar over there my special my acoustic it, it, you know she's my baby so i'm like you know i'm very protective i uh, i'm very, i've been lucky I haven't had anything stolen or lost it so yeah. um i mean there, i've lost a cable here and a guitar stand there oh yeah and um but I've lost a guitar, I, and faithful viewers will know. I yes, it's that story. Um, Hooters Casino, Battle of the Bands. <laughs> First of all, why did I do a Battle of the Bands? <laughs> but it was a Battle of the Bands. We didn't win, and I I put it down on the in the parking lot next to the van, loaded everything up, oh drove away without it. Got home and I said, I really did that, didn't I? And, and of course, yeah. it's gone. Uh, <laughs> do you remember you remember a brand called Tysco? Yeah, they were they sold them in Sears in the fifties and sixties, right? Sixty-five Tysco Del Rey, no green, way, green, which no way. was like not. Yeah, I, I I worked at a pawn shop at the time, and I opened it up, and I'm like, what is that? Yeah, boss, those are collectors' items. Yeah, oh, I mean, the funny thing is, any of them, any Tysco online, hundred sixty-five bucks, almost yeah. always, 150, 165 bucks. They're not expensive; they're just nice and um, it looked cool. Oh my God! It looked. It had a, a mirrored pickguard, but it was striped, so it was like knurled smooth, knurled yeah. smooth. And every single Tysco was set up completely different than any other Tysco with switches <laughs> and knobs. Every you can't, you can't. So that was the thing. Yeah. Um, and it had a um, the bridge was like a big old spring, and it had a whammy bar that started like this and ended like that. And it was just like <laughs> wow, 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 and you wow. see everything moving, and it was just like it's it was heavy, but man, the tone. And I love that guitar, and I can't yeah. believe I did that. Oh, um, my God. Yeah, well, and, and the, um, where is it? This guitar here, yeah, it's in shot, was supposed to be a Tysco replacement I found online. Yeah, it looks sort of like a Tysco. Yeah. It, yes, but it's short. Oh, <laughs> it's, wow. It's like, a, it's like, a, it's like my, my Fender Strat Squire Bullet. Yeah, I have one of those. Yeah, beep, beep, beep. the ninety-nine bucks at Guitar Center. 90, yeah, that was this, my backup guitar. Yeah, well, this um, it's okay. Yeah, but I thought I didn't look at the specs, so there's no whammy, there's no you know, it, and it's not the same. It's pretty. You know, yeah, that's about it. And it yeah. plays, but um, <laughs> Fender Bullet. No. Yeah, ninety-nine bucks. Back when you get ninety nine dollar guitars. Oh yeah, man. I mean that that was the first electric guitar I ever had. Yeah. And, um, wait, I'm sorry. That one. That's the Fender Squire Squ Squ Bullet. That's a okay. silver tone. Um, but yeah, that one is and and that is so freaking ridiculously light and short. Yeah. Like if I put on like a Gretsch, oh my god. 
how, how did you do this, Dave, girl? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I played in bands, I wanted a backup electric, and I didn't have any money. So, so uh, one of the other guys in the band, he's like, dude, we got to go to the store. There's $99 guitars. And I had a red Fender <laughs> Bullet, and he had like a blue one. Oh, man, they were they, – they burned – the pickups burned so hot because it was like cheap, but it gave it a kick-ass sound. Like I, it started becoming my main electric guitar. My main problem with that, the Fender Strat Square Bullet is it was, I don't know why I have to say all the words, is that it was never, it, it wasn't as loud as other yeah. guitars. It just, there was no oomph. So if, if I had it over to do over again, I would like, you know, change out the pickups. Maybe, you know, uh, yeah, that's about it. Change out the pick, pickups. But um, I reached a point, you know, I'm 40, I'll be 48 in 11 days. A time ah, of recording. Yes. Happy birthday soon. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. But I, I've, re- I've reached that point where I'm just like, there, I have a 12 year old daughter. I have a wife, yeah. you know, and cars and, 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 and it's like, do I really need a guitar? Yeah. When I'm especially now not going to go play it. You know, I don't, I don't play the, I don't play these things like I should. Um, sure, yeah. I, I take them down every so often and muck, muck about, but I, I, I do this now. Yeah. You no. Know? And that's the thing is that this is where the passion goes and this is where the creativity goes. And so if you see a video from me where I'm playing, there's a reason. Like, I'm like, okay, I really want to get this out there. Um, uh, I got two CDs to, and I just suddenly dried up in terms of, you know, I used to, used to just write songs, just boom, boom, boom. Yeah, you go through phases, you know. Yeah. Sometimes I just right. recently we were cleaning out a closet, and I found the book. You know that book you've got, the notebook. I yep. found it, and I was like, oh, I forgot about this. Oh, I forgot about this one. I forgot I wrote this one. So, yeah. uh, that's that's when I get to. I'm 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 working on stockpiling a few videos here and scheduling them so that I can spend a little, you know, it's creative time on music and start going through that and start hopefully getting the juices stirring again. We'll see. Yeah. So, um, stay tuned. Well, it's a good way. I, I do that when, when I can't, you know, think of a song or I, my creative juices aren't flowing. I go back and look at the stuff I've written before. And I'm like, oh, that was a pretty good idea. Whatever happened? I don't know. Well, that's no the thing is that I never had, I, I could, didn't know where the book was. Yeah, and, I got to find the book. It's and, and I, and it, because it, it, even if it was just like, I would be, you know, at, at the time I'd be walking to work, okay, sure. riding the bus or whatever. And, and, this something would pop in my head and throughout the course of my shift, I would build a song around it and, and go home, figure out the chords and, and write it down. And that was, you know, that was how I wrote my music. Yeah. Um, but all right. So I digress. <laughs> no worries. That's okay. So we are, uh, we're going to what, get a music video from you after this. Uh, yeah, I can, um, I'll record one and send one to you. Cool. Cool. Um, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Definitely. Definitely stick around after the interview for the, uh, video for what pandemic. Um, if you'd like me to play pandemic, I will play pandemic since it's a new single. It makes sense. Hey, you can play as many songs as you want. Joey played seven. (laughs) I'll play pandemic. Yeah. Right. Um, And this is, Probably the time for me to plug it, I guess, you know? I gotta... Yes, yes. Well, the, normally I say, and where's your next show? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, you've got a new, you've got the new single, Pandemic Out, available all over the place. Links will be in the doobly-doo. Uh, and, and what, uh, let's talk about that song real quick before we sign sure. off here. I, I'm not going to ask what inspired it, but... <laughs> Have you paid attention to the news? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. But I know you're not the first artist to write about it, obviously. Yeah, everyone is. I mean, it's yep. yeah. Um, in fact, I know um, right when it was starting, like a little bit into holy crap, this is a worldwide thing. Twenty One Pilots came out. I think it was with with quarantine. You know, will, oh, really? will you be my quarantine? And I know that uh, Blink One Eighty Two is coming out with a song called Quarantine. So you're late. Yeah. But, um, I was just wondering if did you. Did, was there ever sort of a trepid, like a, a hesitation of like, wait, do I need to put this? Should I should I write this or or is this just jumping on a bandwagon kind of thing? Yeah, there absolutely is. So he, here's the thing: I I think it's 
I try not to write topical um, because here's the thing. It's, uh, you know, two weeks from now, the song may not be relevant. So it dates it. Yeah, it dates, it dates it. the song. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm with you. I, I, trust me, I, more than once I thought, I feel like I should do something about, uh, uh, I should write a song about this. And then I was like, it's being done. Exactly, yeah. But it's, it's funny. Um, there's a little bit of a story behind the song. Um, in terms of the title, obviously, you know, it's what's going on. But a, a group of friends of mine, um, someone from high school, and so we've had, a, it's kind of defunct now, but for about a year or two, we had a, a songwriting group where every two weeks we, someone would pick a title mm-hmm. and then we'd write a song and share it with each other, give each other feedback. So it was a lot of fun. And then it kind of, everyone got busy and whatever and kind of, you know, fell by the wayside. So when all this started, like the first or second week of quarantine, um, someone sent a group text to all the p- folks in the song group and said, title, pandemic. And I was like, okay, yeah. So then um, me and I think one of, <laughs> true, true to our slacker nature of going to, I think me and only one other person like wrote one, but I was like, say no more. I like the title. It's on my mind. I'm like, I'll go topical, full-blown topical. And, you know, right on. Um, what came out was, you know, something that I tried not to make all, the whole thing topical. Um, it's funny. You talk about the, I was talking about roots music earlier. There's a line in there. You, you played me wrecking ball. I played the blues. Cause it's, that it was sort of a nod to some of my friends and family. Like, you know, why don't right. you listen to this? I'm like, I'm listening to Freddie King. I don't really know, care about what Miley Cyrus is doing. But, um, yeah. Anyway, so I, not all of it's topical, but it's largely topical. Right on. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing your, your, your little music video. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank you again for watching Room 6. Thank you for being on Room 6. And uh, yeah, stick around. We're going to see Russell Christian in not Room 6, <laughs> in his place, I guess. Yeah. Um, and again, thank you. And um, there's one other thing. Oh, yeah. Happy Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks again, yeah. Russell. No Thanks problem. again. Thank you. And bye. Ba-da-bum, ba-da-bum. Yeah. All right. Over ten bushes stored It ain't the same as what I did before But it's keeping the lights on We work it out It's all over now Your heart meets a sleeve I'm no longer wrecking what we once believed It's too late for signs In all of my dreams I'm no longer running from life's mysteries Trapped by design Problems systemic Money and medicine Still when the night's long There may be some doubt Is anyone listening? We need to shout But it's all over now No longer choose You played me wrecking ball I played the blues It's too late for signs And all of my dreams I'm no longer running From life's mystery It's all over now, I no longer choose You sang me wrecking ball, I sang the blues It's too late for signs, and all of my dreams